Good afternoon. Uh, I must thank uh, President, Secretary of Kandy Society of Medicine, giving us this opportunity to discuss. I mean, the share the knowledge uh, about management of the constipation. So, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mathula. Uh, discuss uh, some of the points which I have to share. The I mean, uh, when uh, it comes to the management of the adult constipation. So, a uh, disease burden. So when it comes to the adult uh, constipation, so it's a very common clinical uh, uh, symptoms which we uh, encounter in our day-to-day, -day, uh, I mean the day-to-day -day practice. So what they have found out is it's common around, I mean, uh, 10 to 15 percent of the population are disturbed with these uh, clinical symptoms. And uh, when it comes to the prevalence, it is the most prevalent GI condition. Uh, so that is very, I mean, uh, very common in our day-to-day -day I mean, the day-to-day -day practice. So uh, there was an editorial uh, in uh, Lancet published in 2019. So what they have found out that the cost they have is, I mean, the spent in uh, NHS in UK. So it's a quite a lot of money they have uh, invest to manage this complication. So the definition. Uh, so when it comes to the adult uh, constipation. So it consists of a symptom cluster. So if somebody complains of infrequent bowel movement, or if they have uh, experienced hard or lumpy stool, or if they have to uh, strain excessively during the defecation, or if they feel incomplete evacuation or blockade, or if they have to use manual maneuvers to facilitate their evacuation, so we can say that the patient has got uh, constipation. So sometimes it may be acute or if it is going for more than three months, we can call it uh, that's a chronic constipation. And the epidemic, so the prevalence is, as I said, to, it's around 14% and uh, it's more commonly observed in women, all the individuals and the lower socioeconomic uh, groups. So I will discuss this sub uh, subcategories later. So pathophysiology, as Dr. Mathura said, is the mainly the disorder of the brain, I mean the gut-brain interaction. So it may uh, be due to the visceral hypersensitivity that the patient is having or if there is an abnormality in the sensory or motor function, again patient can uh, become constipated or if there is a delayed colonic transit, which is very important in the I mean investigation. -wise. And then uh, if there is an altered uh, central perception, also, patient can develop uh, constipation. So, OIC is that is I, I will uh, be discussing this later. So, when it comes to the diagnosis, so I mean it is similar to evaluating any other gastrointestinal uh, complaint. So, for example, if you uh, want to do the investigation, if you are suspecting uh, if the patient is having colorectal cancer, it's the same uh, I mean uh, approach, but different. I mean, uh, different way that some of the investigation they might not need at the first. So first of all, we have to take the proper clinical history, and then we have to do a thorough uh, gastrointestinal examination, and then we can uh, request uh, some basic laboratory tests. So to uh, investigate further, to look for any organic pathology, then uh, we have to uh, see whether the patient is having any alarming symptom. So this is the same that the Bristol uh, stool cha chart uh, which was discussed by uh, Dr. Mathula. So it is again it's a very validated tool that can be useful in our clinical practice but it's again in the primary or the I mean uh, basically the primary setting. So type 1 and type 2 stools denote hard or lumpy stool and then uh, type 6 and 7 mainly the loose or the watery stool. So the important message here is that we have to remember stool consistency is more reliable indicator rather than the colonic I mean that when it comes to the colonic transit uh, compared to the stool frequency. So that's why they have developed this chart depending on the stool consistency. So uh, sometimes your patient might complain of abdominal pain, bloating and vomiting which may suggest there is nothing I mean much sinister but again we have to get that detail as well. So what are the alarming symptoms we are worried? So these are the things. If the patient is having unintentional weight loss, 
rectal bleeding or if there is any family history of colorectal cancer or inflammatory bowel disease where we need to take a proper history and we might have to go to the depth to rule out these possibilities. So that's why they have told that if somebody come, I mean having uh, alarming symptoms, we should investigate thoroughly. So these are the uh, common drugs which can cause, I mean maybe the culprit to have the constipation. So I have given a, a long list, but to just to uh, highlight the tricyclic, these drugs are very common in our day-to-day -day practice. So those are those can give rise the clinical symptoms of constipation. So other than that, uh, the NSAID, which is again a very common drugs to use, and then the anticonvulsant, sedating, antihistamine like hydroxyzine, and the antimuscarinic. Those are the common culprit drugs to cause constipation. So what are the medical conditions? Depression, diabetes, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypothyroidism, those things, uh, uh, medical condition can give rise to constipation. When it comes to the physical examination, we have to do a thorough uh, physical examination to exclude whether there is any uh, presence of fissures, any mass lesions. DR is very important, that is digital rectal examination. What they have found out is the sensitivity and uh, specificity of DR, mainly in dysenergic defecation is around 75. So, which is very, uh, I mean, important. So, DRE, we must do if somebody complains of constipation. So, what are the basic blood tests? We have to rule out anemia, inflammation. We can do fecal calprotectin test in our setup. And then the thyroid function test, electrolyte like calcium and the celiac disease. So, in one in 10 uh, patients with celiac can present with constipation. That is not, I mean very uh, common presentation of celiac but again you have to keep in mind that it is also a cause to cause the i mean give rise to constipation you are if your patient is postmenopausal women complaints of uh, recent onset of constipation we have to ask for a trans abdominal and transvaginal ultrasound because it may be an early uh, sinister symptom in ovarian cancer which is again an uninvasive test, you can order. What about the colonoscopy and cross-sectional imaging? Yes, to exclude conditions such as uh, colon cancer, IBD, we can ask for uh, colonoscopy and the imaging. But if somebody doesn't have any alarming features, which I have discussed earlier, like weight loss, family history, we usually don't go to a colonoscopy straight away. Instead, they have found out by doing the meta-analysis, there is no association between chronic constipation and the development of colorectal cancer. So, there are evidence not to go to a colonoscopy straight away. So, if somebody has alarming features, yes, we should ask for a colonoscopy. So, there is a test called balloon expulsion test, where especially uh, if you are suspecting somebody having an evacuatory disorder like dysenergic defecation, we can ask that uh, there is a balloon be inserted through the rectum which will uh, fill with the either water or uh, air and will ask patient to evacuate. So, the normal time duration is like 1 to 2 minutes. If they can't uh, do that test, we have to suspect that this energy defecation. So, the manometry which is again very important test which is widely not available unfortunately. We can ask for a patient if you suspect functional defecation disorder. So, if you do digital ex examination, if you found any abnormality or if your patient is refractory to usual medication, then we can ask for these. I mean, these are not first line. These are second line uh, tests we can do. So, it's basic based on anal and rectal resting and squeeze pressure. So, failure to relaxation of the anal sphincter or if there is a paradoxical contraction, you can suspect whether they are, our patient is having the dysenergic defecation. So, basically, uh, it is uh, only the few centers in Sri Lanka doing that. So, if you get a patient, you can refer to a gastroenterology or the surgeon uh, where we can direct them for that. Uh, so, what is called defecography? 
so it's a radiological procedure where we can dynamically get the images of the rectum and the pelvic floor uh, during the attempted defecation where can uh, where we can rule out some of the structural abnormalities the rectal seal rectal prolapse intersusception such as those things so that's basically fluoroscopy guided thing but nowadays we have got mri because uh, it has got some advantages being lack of radiation and the better imaging quality we can ask for mri difficulty it's mainly to extrude the structural abnormal what is colonic transit study so it's a basically uh, if a patient uh, who have got uh, failed medical therapy we can guide them for this study again uh, done here uh, if they have an imaging pathology they should be able to do these tests so it's a simple cheap and a reliable method of measuring colonic transit because it's important when it comes to the mainly the refractory cases of constipation so there are three ways which we can do the test where the patient has to ingest uh, radio opaque markers and they can calculate the remaining markers uh, during the time of the day and then they can measure whether the colonic transit uh, adequate or not and then the, there is a thing called colonic scintigraphy where again patient has to consume a radio label meal and a time measurement where we can uh, check the various call uh, we can calculate transit across the various ds segment and there is a, uh, another device called wireless motility capsule where depending on the ph uh, changes uh, we can detect the transit type so uh, what are the subtypes of uh, constipation in adult uh, management so again the rome four criteria is applicable to uh, adults as well so if somebody comes with the chronic constipation for the last i mean uh, for the previous 3 months or within with onset at least 6 months prior to the uh, problem and if you rule out any uh, organic causes then we can uh, uh, find out whether they are having any functional i mean uh, functional uh, constipation causes so there are four things which is functional constipation irritable bowel syndrome constipation predominant one and then the opioid induced constipation and then the functional defecation disorder i don't think these are very important in the primary care but keep in mind the all the uh, constipation cases are not the same because management is different in these four cases if your patient is having the ibsc which is uh, inflammatory bowel uh, irritable bowel syndrome constipation predominant one the usual complaints of change in stool frequency towards to the uh, infrequent bowel movement and they are uh, stool is more towards hard stool and then uh, the symptoms are mostly related to defecation and uh, if they open the bowel their symptoms might disappear so if that is the case we have to think about whether they are having the ibsc because it's, it's not very uncommon and the functional constipation they should not fulfill the criteria for ibs but instead they will have these symptoms like straining lump your heart stool sensation of incomplete evacuation and a feeling of uh, anorectal obstruction and that they have to use some manual maneuvers to get rid of the uh, stool out of the rectum and then the uh, fever then three spontaneous bowel movements per week so if they fulfill these criteria we can diagnose functional constipation in adult so obviously opioid induced constipation if the new or worsening symptoms of constipation occurred in the settings of uh, initiating changing or increasing opioid therapy because it it's a uh, common uh, cause for constipation in our setup so there are some functional defecation defecating disorder which i am not going to discuss in detail but to give some points so it is mainly due to the uh, impaired rectal evacuation so there are three tests which we can do to diagnose this condition which i have already discussed Uh, the patient should have abnormal balloon expulsion test abnormal anorectal uh, i mean abnormal anorectal manometry and then the impaired uh, rectal evacuation on defecography 
when it comes to the treatment of uh, adult constipation it should be they should be managed in a logical step wise manner simple conservative measures should always uh, be started uh, before going to the secondary pharmacological therapy and you might need a uh, surgical intervention very rarely if all the other measures are failed so what are the general conservative approach so the first of all uh, it's similar to the pediatric population we should have a very good rapport with the patient so the patient, patient should listen actively to identify the patient's concern and their understanding of the disorder and then only we can make a realistic goal uh, involved in the patient treatment is rather than we direct i mean the we issue the director because otherwise patient doesn't know what we are tackling and the patient should not comply with our management uh, steps if you do follow these steps then it improves patient satisfaction and the compliance with the therapy and uh, mostly that uh, it reduces subsequent physician visit because if you come to the uh, gi clinic most of the time what happens is that you give some medications you don't ask that the why patient are here and then they will uh, it, it, it is not uh, settling their the symptoms so they usually keep on coming with the same complaint without much improvement so what are the lifestyle and dietary modification they have found out that the increase fluid intake uh, which increases the stool frequency but uh, they have done the trial with the mineral water so what they have postulated is that it is because of the magnesium content they will have the stool frequency but not the amount what you are, but average amount of uh, daily water intake is roughly 2 liters and uh, it's again the same for the regular exercise what they have found out is at least you should have the 20 minute walk and you should recommend for patient who are keep on coming this because sometimes you have patients are having other metabolic risk factors like obesity uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease which is very important in the management the regular exercise how does it improve the constipation issue what they have postulated is that they modulate anti-inflammatory and anti-oxidative mechanism so that is the way they will sort out the constipation so we have got evidence so that we can uh, recommend without any doubt so supplementary the diet with fiber again so fiber rich diet which uh, whole uh, i mean uh, which enhance the water holding properties of these two and that it forms gels to provide stool lubrication and uh, it provides bulk for the stool and stimulate peristalsis so obviously that is the reason but again to tell that uh, so they it is limited to soluble fiber not the insoluble sometimes if your patient is having the ibsc symptom by supplementing with diet their symptoms might get aggravated so you have to be very careful if you advise because moderate amount is the recommendation not the high five always we are talking so what are the pharmacological therapies so i will uh, discuss the detail here so few points here uh, meta-analysis they have found out osmotic laxative is superior to placebo for functional constipation and uh, polyethylene glycol was superior to lactulose so those are with i mean uh, highlighting point here so those are the research evidence will tell you so these are few of the classes which we are commonly encounter in our clinical practice so the bulk form is laxative laxative they will increase fecal mass so it has got a stimulating peristalsis so then we can uh, get rid of the some of the symptoms so what are the common uh, drug uh, we can use so the spagula husk and the sterculia. So these are the commercially available uh, preparation in our practice. You can use whenever you need it and at the uh, beginning you can give it uh, on regular doses. The bulk forming laxative, the methyl cellulose and then the, the one of the common uh, drug classes is stimulating, la stimulating laxative. 
which mainly consists of drugs like bisacodyl, senna, sodium picosulfate, glycerol. Those are very common and uh, doesn't have much side effects, so we can use in a patient demanding basis. And the fecal softeners like docusate sodium, which is available here, we can use in patients with constipation. So what are the osmotic laxatives available? So the lactulose, macrogol, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium sulfate, phosphate in eva. So these are the commercially available uh, preparation which we usually commonly use in our patients. These are some newer drugs which we can uh, use in our clinical practice. I will use some of uh, the more details about these drug classes. If the patient is having opioid induced constipation, which is called OIC, we can use uh, naloxagol, that is to reverse the peripheral constipatory effects of opioid, which is available in these forms. So, stimulant laxatives are very common we use in our practice, uh, especially if the osmotic laxative pay. So, uh, they have found out bisacodyl and uh, sodium uh, picosulfate are superior to placebo. So, those are the mainly drugs which we are using in our setup as well. But uh, they will give some of the adverse effects like bloating, uh, abdominal pain, cramping and loose stool, which some of the things are disturbing to our patient. So, these are the some new drugs, especially in the settings of refractory constipation. The drugs called linoctoride, picanide, and the lubiprostol. These are uh, available in our setup, but the problem is these are a bit expensive. So, the, mainly the linoctoride, which is a very good drug in the patients, uh, especially in IBSC group, where uh, we can uh, try osmotic and the stimulant. If they fail, we can go for these drugs. They don't have much side defects, but again, uh, sometimes uh, it may be uh, disturbing the patient with the diarrhea or the nausea. This is uh, one other drugs which is not very commonly, but commonly used in at least in the GI practice, procalopride, which uh, drug which is uh, 5-HT4 agonist. That it accelerates gastrointestinal motility. And it improves abdominal pain, discomfort, and bloating. We can even use in opioid induced constipation if the naloxagol is not working. Common side effects are diarrhea, headache, but they disappear within first few weeks of the treatment. So we starting with uh, we start with the two milligram daily dose, and if there's a good response, even we can go up to three months. But what they say is that uh, if there is no response within three months, we have to stop it. Again, this is a bit uh, expensive drug, but it, it works on some patients. So, especially uh, if they are refractory to other medication. So, again, that the opioid induced constipation. So, there are some few uh, newer drugs therapies. Unfortunately, these are not available in our setup. Mainly, these are uh, induces bile acid, I mean, malabsorption. They are increasing the bile acid in the GI lumen where it drags the water and uh, has uh, given rise, I mean, they give rise to a uh, stimulant activity. So, hello, hello, Bixi tag batch and the chenodioxicolate, those are newer emerging therapy if your patients are still uh, refractory to other medications. So, what are the other treatment options? So, I will uh, do a few words about the anorectal biofeedback because sometimes. Especially in a patient with a dysenergy defecation, they have a response rate of approximately 70%. So, if biofeedback is a very important in functional constipation. So, it's a mainly uh, uh, you have to prove the uh, constipation disorder by doing the anorectal manometry, and then only you can uh, ask uh, refer them for the biofeedback therapy. It is basically the relearned proper toileting behavior and then the, uh, they will educate how to relax the pelvic floor muscle. It's a, uh, but they have found out that uh, it is superior to 
some of the standard therapy like laxative for dyssynergic defecation. But unfortunately, it's available only in some centers. And uh, now they are introducing home-based biofeedback because it is cost effective in that case. So it's basically the education and the training uh, how to go for a, a proper defecation. So if everything is well, we can go for the transanal ir uh, irrigation where uh, there are some devices which they have introduced. These are a bit expensive. But uh, if you are really uh, concerned, uh, we can uh, direct them for these things. It's not widely available uh, because it improves bowel function and the quality of life. But unfortunately, with the time, patient used to discontinue a treatment within the first year uh, of their starting the treatment because they don't feel much effect while on the course. So the nerve stimulation, they have some, uh, done some studies using the sacral nerve and the tibial nerve uh, stimulation, which they have uh, some of the uh, promising uh, evidence. So the colonic surgery is the last option if your patient is required to all the medication, where the, uh, we can refer them uh, for the surgical intervention, where they might offer ileorectal anastomosis or ileostomy. Uh, but keep in mind, before referring to the surgical option, you have to see that whether they are having the panenteric dysfunction uh, or IBSC or the OIC because if it is the case, it may be detrimental. So you have to select the uh, patient group which might need surgical intervention. So these treatments are not recommended. but in primary care, you may try. So, gut microbiota or the probiotic, they have limited evidence to support in, in you, uh, when it comes to the constipation management. What about the prokinetics? Yes, theoretically, it should improve the symptoms of constipation, but unfortunately, uh, they recommend to give uh, intravenously. So, the drugs like domperidone, erythromycin, metoclopramide, uh, they can give rise uh, loose stool. So that's why they have uh, mentioned that is uh, one steps we can use in our patient management. Cholinergic agonist, which is not very common to use. So few words about the constipation in pregnancy. It's common. About 38% of pregnant women experience uh, constipation during the pregnancy. Uh, mainly in the management, uh, if you uh, apart from the dietary modification and the exercise, we can offer them uh, drugs like uh, bulk forming one and the fecal softeners and then the osmotic agents. But you have to start with the safer drugs like uh, bulk forming one. This is, that is the first slide. Keep in mind, you have to avoid Senna because it might uh, induce uterine contraction. So constipation in cancer, yes, because they use opioid in uh, cancer management, so they can give rise opioid in this constipation. Again, uh, we can use stool softness, stimulant laxative, or specific drugs like naloxone. But still, we have to encourage to uh, consume a fiber rich diet and the, uh, that uh, good uh, fluid intake. So, I think uh, that's all I want to discuss with you. So, in conclusion, so it is, I mean, stepwise management is the best approach in the management of uh, adults. And there are some uh, high uh, advanced uh, tests which we can do uh, in our setup, but primary care level, you might not offer those things where you have to refer to the secondary care. And uh, if you develop a good rapport with your patients, we might not need a lot of pharmacological agents, but uh, still we can manage and uh, we can uh, we can go to uh, this is where they don't need any pharmacological management so that's all uh, any problem we can have a chance thanks